Hi, I'm Jim Carroll. I'm here in Palo Alto, California with Big Switch Networks. I'm speaking with Kyle Forster, the co-founder and uh, VP of Sales and Marketing. Uh, Kyle, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Last time we, we talked in September of 2011, um, you said that one of the key drivers behind the uh, software-defined networking space was the challenge of multi-tenancy. Is that still the case, and if so, why? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we like to think of there being, we start calling it three steps to epiphany with our customers. Uh, you know, most folks come in and they see some of the early, you know, early SDN demos, they see some of the product literature. Um, they hear folks talking about some of the different architectures, what they're doing around SDN, and the, you know, the single point of control, single point of management, you know, single point of automation uh, immediately clicks, and a lot of folks say, okay, I, I get that piece. Uh, that's been going for a while. When we last talked in September, an increasing number of, increasing number of major networking builds, uh, you know, the folks close to them started saying, hey, the operational piece that I think is really interesting here is that I can take one data center, and in much the same way that server virtualization lets me take one server and have you know, five different owners of operating systems on that and create a good demark point to say, that's your responsibility and I'll take care of the underlying physical server. Uh, an increasing number of folks look at the, with the large builds saying, hey, we wanna have one team own the underlying physical network but be able to delegate out slices of the network to different organizations, either in an enterprise infrastructure as a service type of thing or in a public cloud infrastructure as a service type of thing. So that multi-tenancy aspect, when we last talked, you know, we're seeing an increasing number of folks kind of getting all the way there with it. The third step in the epiphany chain that we're just starting to see an increasing number of early adopters really embrace at this point um, is using SDN and OpenFlow to create, you know, from one data center, one large pool of resources. So get away from the pod by pod by pod design. Instead say, hey, I want to have one large pool of resources I want to take all of my tenants, all my applications that are spread throughout that, and I want to effectively, we started calling it defrag my data center. Uh, same if you think, you know, five years ago on your laptop, you had a hard drive and you say, you know, okay, I need to defrag my hard drive, and you saw, you know, the wheel spin as the sectors on your drive get pushed. We're doing the exact same thing, basically. The early adopters are doing the exact same thing at the data center level. Saying, I want to take my applications that are sort of lightly loaded, and I want to defrag them all down into one small side of my data center in order to get CPU compute, CPU and memory utilization way up. We're seeing this as the absolute key to competing against the economics, where Amazon EC2 has set a, a very high bar for both pub, public and private cloud alike. It seems that there's a lot of marketing slogans in this space. People talk about liberating pools of resources and, and uh, self-provisioning, automating the network. How much of those slogans have an actual business case behind them? So I, I certainly think all, and there's a, you know, they come in three forms. There's, the, hey, this saves a ton of hours. There's, hey, this creates new DMARC points that lets me have a more flexible organization. And then the third is just hard dollar savings. They sort of map well, I think, to that, the three steps of epiphany model of, hey, this single point of control uh, maps very well to saving a large number of saving a large number of hours, right? And you see that show up in some of the marketing slogans, but there is very real business cases there. Uh, you certainly see the multi-tenancy aspects, create new organizational DMARC points. That lets you have a more flexible organization. And it's hard to quantify, but there's a very compelling business case there for the right organizations. And then the third piece, the defrag data center piece, well, that's where there's a very clean hard dollar savings. I mean, the difference between running a, uh, a data center at 20% compute CPU and memory utilization versus 80% is massive. So we're really seeing it across the board. There's the hour savings, there's the organizational flexibility, and then there's the true hot dollar savings. So, so VMware has become pretty much synonymous with uh, virtualization. Um, is there something that you can provide those folks from day one that makes their view of virtualization easier or better? Sure. I think in, in small VMware deployments, in deployments that were the state of the art, four and five years ago, right, several racks. It's a simple network design. You plumb every VLAN everywhere, you trunk everything, and you're there. But over the last, especially over the last three years, as the common case deployment has gone up from three racks to 30 racks to, to, to 10 hundreds of racks, then suddenly this all VLANs everywhere architecture for VMware no longer, no longer makes any sense, right? Switches don't, don't scale that way. You can't have everything running into the trunk. Um, 
so the common case that we see in these larger deployments is effectively a VMware deployment that's been broken out into a series of fairly small and very static pods. VM mobility is limited to within that pod, but very frequently we find that there's a lot of wasted capacity within that pod. You might have capacity in a pod for say 30 VMs, but you might have a new application come up that requires 40 VMs. What do you do? Does that mean they actually have to go out and spin up a whole other pod? That's a very expensive and time consuming exercise. So what we do with a lot of VMware builds even today is say, okay, you need 40 VMs worth of capacity for a particular application. Well, let's grab you know, capacity for 10 VMs out of this pod, 10 VMs over here, 5 VMs there, 5 VMs there, another 10 out of the fourth. And altogether, you get an aggregate of 40 VMs worth of capacity, but we can use capacity that would otherwise be stranded on a pod-by-pod -pod basis. And that's been extremely attractive. Okay. Um, so is open, is the open and open flow really open? So, you know, that is a great question, because I think 2012, we even had the, uh, there was an analyst who, who said, hey, 2012 is going to be the branch here, whether we figure out if this is truly open flow or if uh, the vendors who are espousing closed flow are going to wind up carrying the day. Uh, in my view, open flow, and more broadly speaking, the, the umbrella term of software-defined networking is being used, and we certainly see it unfortunately being used, to paint features that are three, five, seven years old. You know, our view is that customers are going to speak loudest, and what we hear back is that customers want open software-defined networking. Uh, what we hear back is very positive response to the idea that open software-defined networking is components that are open source. Compute teams have been doing this for a long time. It's just not the culture of networking, and it's badly needed. Uh, a culture of open APIs. Hey, we have features on our roadmap, right? A vendor should. But if a customer sees something further out, well, they have the right to build themselves on top of an API. They can hire another vendor to build on top of an API. Again, these are what we consider to be the norm for computing, but just have never sunk into the networking industry. So open source, open APIs, and open standards, specifically multi-vendor standards. Right? The standard we care about most is OpenFlow. But you know, I think that for us, 2012 is going to be a big year where the customer voice gets heard and gets heard specifically on those three dimensions of open SDN. Okay. Are there some open group points in 2012? I think 2012, you know, first of all, we're going to see a, an increasing number of customers start announcing, which is a ton of fun. Uh, you know, we, uh, I view for, you know, there was an early adopter, or there is an early adopter segment rather for, for any networking technology, but really for SDN, you know, an extreme way of folks who were really in discussions in 2010, who were in pilots in 2011, and who are going to go into production in 2012. I think that there's another segment of folks who, who really want to see sort of, okay, show me the five builds that are out there in the world first before I make a pilot decision. Um, and for that crew, there were, you know, the discussions really started happening in 2011, pilots are starting in 2012, and production builds are going to start in 2013. So I think that we're in this very, very interesting year for, uh, for the entire SDN ecosystem, really. Okay, so I know that uh, Big Switch has been in beta for a while, and uh, you recently announced a new uh, Floodlight product. Could you tell me about these, and how far along are you guys now in the market? Sure. Um, you know, our control went into our, we went into our first production environment uh, over a year ago now, almost a year and a quarter. Uh, the, uh, but to get oriented, we actually view, you know, and I think any of us, any of the vendors are, that are close to, to production builds in the SDN ecosystem have, have this sort of three-tier model. Uh, there's the data plane layer of physical switches and hypervisor switches. There's the controller layer uh, of kind of the core controller itself. Uh, and then of a ton of interest is, is the application layer of network control applications that are built on top of these controllers. The What we just announced is we took actually uh, you know, a big hunk of our core controller area, and we took several of the applications that we have on top of it, and we open sourced those as Project Floodlight. So Floodlight, uh, it was actually amazing to all of us. I mean, in the first six weeks, got uh, over a thousand downloads. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe just how many companies are now reaching out to us saying, hey, we're looking at potentially building a product on top of Floodlight. Uh, we've taken a huge amount of community, you know, basically communities con contributed code and accepted, I think we've accepted every single contribution. Uh, back to mainline. So we have a very, very active environment community at this point. Uh, so it's a really, it's, it's just a really exciting area. I mean, it's a, it's a real production great controller. All right, great. Um, is uh, Big Switch aligned with any other uh, major Switch players, or are there any major players that you see most often in the trials and deployments that you've been in? <laughs> Nothing I can talk about yet, but, uh, but hold tight. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks so much, Evan.